G'day everyone, I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome to our final poll position before the election and tonight we're in prime time. Thank you so much for joining us in the evening as opposed to uh, afternoons like we normally do. Uh, we hope you're having a good campaign out there. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that Canberra is Ngunnawal and Ngambri country and pay my respects to elders past and present. Sovereignty was never ceded and we should all be working towards uh, voice, treaty and truth, that wonderful invitation from the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Days and times for Australia Institute webinars do vary, so make sure you head on over to australiainstitute.org.au forward slash webinars to find those. Tomorrow, we'll be talking to Australian Greens leader Adam Bant about phasing out fossil fuels. That's at 11 a.m. and that's our final webinar for the election campaign. Just a few Zoom tips before we begin uh, to help things run smoothly today. You can, as always, type questions in for our panel using the Q&A box and you can upvote other people's questions as well. A reminder to please keep things civil and on topic in the chat or we'll boot you out. And lastly, a reminder that this is a live event and it is being recorded. The video will go up on the Australia Institute's YouTube channel. Uh, and it will go up as an episode of The Guardian's Australian Politics Podcast tomorrow morning. For all those listening from the pod, you can find the results of the slides that we're going through today and play along at home by visiting essentialreport.com.au. So here we are in the final days of the campaign. I'm not sure if you're joining us with a drink in your hand, but unfortunately, <laughs> I am still at work <laughs> and... Um, uh, I was going to do this from home, but I have broadband that's absolutely <laughs> rubbish. So I've decided to stay in the office. But I hope wherever you are, you've got a lovely um, glass of tipple of your choice and joining us from the comfort of your couch or elsewhere. Um, it is the final days of the campaign and the polls have tightened, a number of polls, including Guardian Essential. The Prime Minister has been relentlessly on message um, with its policy to raid your super to buy a home. Uh, Anthony Albanese was at the press club today talking about stopping rorts and government waste amongst other things, while Prime Minister Scott Morrison became the first PM in five decades not to do a press club address. Just to really cheer you up, COVID numbers are through the roof and the latest wages data shows that real wages in the past 12 months fell 2.5% as Greg Jericho, who writes often for The Guardian and uh, works at the Australia Institute Centre for Future Work, says real wages are now below what they were at the last election, think about that, and are essentially no different from where they were at the September 2013 election. To help steer us through these final days of the campaign and make sense of all the numbers, I'm delighted to welcome our regular panellist, Catherine Murphy, Chief Political Correspondent at Guardian Australia, and Pete Lewis, Executive Director of Essential Media. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. I thought this was going to be drunk politics. It's only going to be me, <laughs> drunk pollster. Anyway. We'll have to make do with drunk pollster. I think there could be legs in that concept, Pete. But Catherine, I will come to you first before we dig into the numbers. You know, it's the final week, the polls are tightening. I would have thought real wages going backwards was Labor's turf, but the PM's had a bit of a, a cracking week this week. Um, where do you think things are at as of this moment? Well, the bulldozer is accelerating towards the finish. I think that's where we are. The bulldozer knows where he wants to get over these uh, closing days of the campaign. He knows who he's talking to uh, and he's reduced uh, his messages uh, to, to two, Ebb. Uh, there's, there's only really two in these closing days of the campaign. The first message is for any uh, undecided voters, soft liberal voters who hate me, think I'm abrasive and annoying and they can't stand another second of me, what I'm telling them is I can change. I can be better. I can be less abrasive. I can change my leadership style. I can learn from my time. I'm in office, so you know I'll be better next time. Is what the prime minister is telling those soft voters. So that's message one. Message two is I'm the guy that will allow you 
to uh, pull money out of your super to buy a house. Home ownership being one of the most salient issues in the country at the moment because of what's happening to property prices and a whole generation of people being locked out of the housing market. The Prime Minister just has a very poor policy, but a very simple message, which is I'm the guy who will unlock that lump of savings that will make the difference in you getting a deposit to buy your house. So that's it. Two messages for the last two last few days of the campaign. I, I can be different. So if I'm a barrier to entry for you, understand that I will that I will I won't be the same next time. And I'm the guy who's going to connect you with your house purchase. So uh, he is uh, he is a formidable campaigner, the Prime Minister, uh, not a great Prime Minister, but a formidable campaigner. And I think, uh, yeah, what what the, the closing days of the contest show us is that he knows exactly who he's speaking to, exactly who he needs to shift from soft to firm votes. Now, will it work? Well, we'll all find out on Saturday night. We surely will. And that brings me to the numbers, Pete Lewis. Um, walk us through this tightening that we're seeing. Do you want me to pull the slides up or do you want to give us well, a bit? Well, no, why don't we... We, we, you know, lance the boil. Um, I would love to be turning up and telling all our crowd that we're on track for a landslide, a victory on election night. And I still think it's more likely than not that there is a path to victory for Labor um, to form government in their own right or at a minimum with um, existing um, independent and green. There's two seats there. But um, that there was not a widening in our poll over the last two weeks. In fact, and you can go to the share if you like, Eb, and for those playing at home, as we said before, essentialreport.com.au. Um, it wasn't, oh, my God, the sky has fallen in on Labor. The primary vote is actually stable, 36 coalition, 35 Labor. There was a bit of a shift between Green voters to other independent Um there was also still 7% undecided, and we'll go back to there in a sec. So there was a shift. Last time we spoke, it was 49, 45, I believe, um, with 7% undecided. This time it's narrowed, 48, 46. We've got 7% who still can't tell us um, how they're going to vote, but they are still going to have to go into the booth and vote. And we talk to these people in focus groups, and they look at politics out of the corner of their eye. And to um, Catherine's point, Morrison, you can say what you like about him. He can deliver a message once he's decided what it's going to be, even if it is total BS, like bulldozing my ass. Like his problem was he never turned up. He didn't do anything. So um, we, I think a convergence of events, like sometimes, and we we take this last poll really seriously because we get judged by it. We spend the whole cycle saying it's not a horse race, but the reality is we are still judged by what we put in front of people about and we, our guys went over the models, the waiting for most of the day yesterday because the zeitgeist, I think, was around, oh, it's widening, Labor's on their way. The, the last week was talking about wages, you know, and we all look at it from our perspective and he looks like he's flailing around like a drunken idiot. But um, the convergence was that Resolve, which is a very different poll, who we don't quite know how it works because they've refused to join the Australian Polling Council. And unlike that, they don't keep the undecideds in. In fact, they don't let people say, I'm undecided. They force a vote, which in my theory pumps up the vote for both Greens and Independents, came up with a tightening as well. So all of a sudden, two points make a line and the election's tightening. Now, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, and we can talk a bit that, may, may, so maybe, you know, we hate the horse race, but there's the horse race. Yeah. Labor has, and Catherine and I were also umming and ahhing, how do you report that last night? Is Labor ahead? No, Labor has more people committed to voting for them at this point than the Liberals do, but there are still 7% undecided. This chart that you've got now, Eb, shows the trend line. It's basically where it was at the start of the campaign. There was a couple of weeks, actually, when Albo had COVID, when it went a bit better, I think, in primary, <laughs> but um, 35, we oh, won't talk about that. Um, but then um, in terms of the 2PP, you can see it's bounced around a little bit. It's never got over 50% without the undecided. So no one's ever been ahead of the finish line because a finish line doesn't exist. Um, now, in these walls, 
if we use the old formula, it's somewhere between 51 and 52 to 48, 49, but we're not going to put a number on that because we said the whole time we're not doing a horse race. It's close. I think it will be decided, decided in different electorates on different issues. We, I've been talking for a while that we've got three um, electoral contests going on. We've got a contest where Labor's trying to pick up seats from the Liberals in kind of outer or inner ring middle class seats. If you think Perth, South Adelaide, Melbourne, Sydney, you've got, you know, we can name them off if we want. We can play Trivial Pursuit, but it's basically Swan, Boothby, Chisholm and Reid. Um, and then there's some outer ring seats that live still think they've got a shot at running, which is a totally different campaign. And if the theory is that Morrison is some form of mastermind, that's the Catherine Dees attack um, being amplified into areas that voted no on the same sex marriage. And then you've got the battle for the teals in the inner city, which really confounds the whole idea of 2PP because these are liberal voters. And on our numbers, most of them are saying they're going to preference that they would preference Labor. Um, yeah. which will be interesting. We can do an analysis later in the week. I feel like Catherine needs to come in at some stage here because I've taken up quite a bit of oxygen there and I've got so much more to say. All right. Well, Why don't we get Catherine to talk a little bit about those different fights on different demographic areas because they are interesting. Yeah. So, Catherine, I was going to say uh, there has been a theme, uh, particularly with so many female independent candidates running um, about the coalition's problem with women um are we certainly seeing that reflected in these results well i think uh just sort of in i'll come to i'll come to women in one sec but just on the helicopter point right of where where are we at this point in time well that well the diff the primary difficulty that we have is uh as as pete suggests basically this election is going to be decided in a handful of seats and what we're looking at in terms of the metrics that we're that that we gathered around the campfire with tonight, right? Looking at the metrics, they tell us about a mythical national position, right? When we actually want to know is is what's the outlook seat by seat. So this gives us, a, you know, if we were in the castle, we'd say this gives us the vibe of the thing, <laughs> but it does not give us the granularity of the thing. So just just as, mm. as long as we're clear, and then people and and that. to be clear, there's been many an election, or I don't know how many, but definitely at least a few that I can remember, where one party wins the popular vote and yes. does not win enough marginal yeah, seats. To exactly, the yeah. exactly. So this is just why we're putting doubt up in lights. What have we been doing these last three years, people? We have been putting putting doubt up in lights and we're going to do it again tonight because it is the relevant consideration here in terms of women we'll look in in sort of helicopter terms uh there the, the prime minister there's there's a gender gap uh men like him more than women uh women are uh, seem to be voting uh, you know more inclined to vote for labor than uh than for scott morrison and the coalition but if we sort of look closely at some of these numbers and the trend of these numbers since December, there is an interesting shift in, in a cohort of women between 18 and 34, that basically since December last year, we have seen that group start to drift and, and bifurcate. We've seen uh, some of those women sort of uh, come back in the coalition's direction, and we've seen some of those women go in the Greens direction. So... While at the at you know at the macro level, um, definitely women uh, women are preferring Labor in this contest than the Prime Minister, and you know it, it, we can we don't need to speculate on why that would be the case. We've all lived here for the last eighteen months, but I do think it is interesting, and sort of getting back to Morrison's final messages. Right, if we go back to that point a minute ago, that there are only two messages that the Prime Minister is dwelling on in these closing days. I can change, I can get you your house, right? If we think again about that cohort of women from 18 to 34, uh, we, can see, we can see the Prime Minister's tactics, right? In terms of who he's speaking to, who he is trying to shift from soft to firm. So- Although Catherine, a lot of women have told me that that I can change from a bloke is kind of a, a regulation playbook. No, no, well it, well, it is. I mean, we- you know, we, we, we're not commenting at this point, Pete, on the efficacy of the messaging. <laughs> what we're saying at this point is what's in the mind of the Prime Minister. What he needs to do to exactly. stay alive. His diagnostic of how, 
you know, how I hang on, how do mm. I hang on? Uh, so anyway, I just think that's an mm. interesting little subcurrent sitting under women. Um, obviously, you know, it, it, a lot of uh, liberals all around the country tell you that uh, there is a, a visceral backlash against the prime minister amongst professional women. Anecdotally, you hear that all the time. Liberals are saying, you know, women will cross the street to tell me I cannot vote for Scott Morrison. I just, I cannot. I, I've seen the last 12 months and that's it for me, right? So the conventional wisdom becomes, uh, you know, women will kill Morrison at this election. Well, sort of, but there's some wrinkles sitting, sitting, sitting underneath. Not all of them. <laughs> Not all of them, exactly. All right. Well, that might take us back to these uh, demographics if I can pull them up. Yeah. Pete, I just wanted to ask you about those differences between inner and outer metro. I don't know what you mean by provincial there. So if you could um, tell well, me. Well, provincial there. are your regional centres, your Wollongongs. Like your Newcastles. Your Geelong, Newcastle. Geelong. Yeah. Yep. And they're, they're areas where Labor is very competitive and hold a lot of seats. It's the rurals, but the outer, outer rings where the coalition's ahead. Yep. And then I think the inner metro is really interesting because obviously that's aggregated, including um, your teal independence. And we have not, you know, they've been a challenge. Like if we were just um, distributing preferences based on the last election, it would be very difficult. So we've been asking people to, to sort of nominate who their second preference is. So there's, you can clearly see in those city regions a significant gap gap for Labor. But if you go to the next one, the Morrison journey just reinforces a little bit about what Catherine was saying. So if you have a look at his long and winding road, the blue line is approvals. Um, there have been two kind of moments where he's sort of fallen from a peak. The first one was during the bushfires. Um, and then the second one you can see in about February 21 was off the back of Brittany Higgins and that whole moment that I know Murph was covering close at hand and he's bounced around but he's, he's it, it's been a long that has been a long decline which now has him you know less popular I think I'm right in saying than Tony Abbott was um even at late stages of his prime ministership so you know I've, I've found it interesting watching Morrison sort of grasp um, I, I do think the bulldozer is an interesting construct, given that really the criticism isn't that he bulldozes through and does things, but he doesn't do anything at all and doesn't show up and doesn't hold a hose. So I think it's been this kind of what's your biggest weakness? Oh, I try too hard sort of moment, um, which we all know from job interviews. Um, but <laughs> but um, too much of a hard worker. Yeah, I just care <laughs> too much sometimes. Um, but yeah, there you are. And he's still breathing. Um, maybe only for another 48 or so hours, but he's still breathing. Um, if you look at Albo, the journey's been a little bit um, slower and harder. Um, I'll just sort of, you've got it on the screen there. I'll put it on mine so I can actually read it. It's been a positive upward, but you can see that that moment after, like we've engaged, he started, he was heading in this direction up and it's kind of flatlined um, just a little bit and the approval has kind of dropped through the game on stage of the campaign. Um, so again, um, oh, sorry, just lost my head gear. Um, I, think, I think if Labor gets there, we're going to be saying really, really good strategy. And um, I don't know about the execution. We just got over the line. Like, I feel that if the campaign had been everything it could have been, we'd be smashing it at the moment. And I feel like we, we're in there. But as you can see, um, it, it's still pretty noisy for, um, for our potential future prime minister. Preferred PM. Heading in the right direction, but not quite hard enough to say, yeah, game over. Like a week out from the election, you've still got 20 odd percent of people saying they don't know who the preferred PM is. And we've yeah. given them ample opportunity now. Um, but again, it's the low information voter who looks at politics out of the corner of their eye that ultimately determines the result. Yeah. Uh, and for those playing at home, that's 40% prefer Scott Morrison, 37% Albo and 23% undecided. 
Just saying, it's a rubbish metric because one person is prime minister and the other one hasn't been yet. So <laughs> it's always been a rubbish metric, but we put it out there for want of anything better. So I apologise. If you go though to the next one, it's interesting. Just like, and everyone, you know, I get it. Everyone's having flashbacks. Like I know everyone on this call is. I know I am is having flashbacks at the moment to 2019. There are some underlying differences. This is one of them, as you can see. Um, that's, you know, five points higher and preferred. So Albo is better positioned than Bill was in 2019. Um, although Morrison, while his disapprovals are much higher than they were last time, he's still in that head-to-head -head contest holding, holding in there. Um, I also, so there's a couple of other markers that will show in a sec that make me think, I don't think it's deja vu all over again. I do think that this is a different journey that we're on. But again, as um, Catherine said, doubt is our friend. Um, we've been asking people, do they think Australia is heading in the right or the wrong direction? I was pretty worried in um, April when there was a gap opening up saying, yep, we're on the right track. That switched the other way and we're net negative, but again, line ball. So that's one of the markers that often we pundits and pollsters think that's a good indication of whether people want to change government, as is the next slide. Um, views towards re-electing the federal government um, deserves to be re-elected, 34%. Time to give someone else a go, 49%. What's interesting there is 34% is basically the coalition primary vote. Um, everyone else is either thinking about it or saying it's time to give someone else a go. If, you're, if that was your only metric, Labor would be going, yep, here we go. Um, what size curtains do we want in the new offices? <laughs> um, finally, and I've got two more I want to show and then we'll open it up. So, and, and what we're trying to do is just take this voter choice from a whole lot of different angles. Catherine and I spoke about this one quite a bit before we were in the field. We were trying to um, honestly and faithfully put forward what we think each party is wanting people to be thinking about when they go into the ballot box. This is what my... Um, long-term business partner, Tony Douglas, calls the voter choice. So his theory is elections are actually decided on the choice voters are asking as they go in. So 2019, the coalition won the campaign and the question voters were asking was, do you want to pay higher taxes? That what that, that's what they're asking themselves as they went into the, um, the ballot box. And that's why we lost. Um, this time, I think, and it might have shifted, and I think it probably has in the last week, the coalition wanted to say we need a government that will say we need a safe pair of hands to lead Australia through uncertain times. And I think Labor was wanting to say we need a government that will confront the big problems that Australia is facing. Like not in those words, they had fancy slogans, but they were the two frames. Um, 6634, people want government um, confronting. They're not so worried about the safe pair of hands. And I think Morrison knows that. And I think that's partly why there was that shift over the weekend and particularly around his launch, which I think was Labor was running better future, so Morrison ran stronger future. Um, but all of a sudden, he was no longer saying, oh, be scared because this guy can't remember questions at a press conference. He was actually saying, I've actually got a plan. And then his sort of brain fart on um, super um, and housing was the expression of that, that brighter future. Yeah. Which brings me to my final data point that does make me worry and probably make sure I have that bottle of scotch close to, to um, hand. Um, in 2019, when all the polls were saying, yeah, it's going to be a change, I said, well, let's ask people how happy they are. And the findings came back, yeah, we're pretty happy. And I said, well, does a happy nation change government? Um, there is a theory that you need an optimistic government to embrace a progressive government, but there is also a sense that if you just, you know, happy with your lot, staring into your iPhone, why are you going to bother changing government? Yeah. I thought there would be a big shift downwards in happiness. So this is to me, we're either remarkably resilient or we are living in one of the wealthiest nations still in one of the most prosperous times in history. And it's been a hard, hard road these last three years. But even on financial um, situation, we're saying we're happier than we were back in May 2019. Um, and that's with cost of living going through the roof. So I'm not saying that it, this is not a referendum on happiness, this election, but it was just another data point that I thought was interesting that sort of, I guess, feeds into this sense. It's not a done deal. Um, and all the all the big poll, and there's been some crazy polls out over the last few weeks, 57, 43, like that Labor's going to win everything except Bradfield, you know, like that's not going to happen. Um, there was the YouGov 
data science, which I'm happy to talk about later because it's really interesting and, and, and worthy of a bit of um, a, 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 a discussion that Labor would pick up 80. I reckon that's going to be a high tide. Like I still think there is a path to 76, but um, it's going to be... It's going to be a long night, I reckon. I don't know. I know Catherine's yeah, never I, thought I it was going to get there. I, I hope it won't be a long night. Um, whichever way it goes, I just want to know early so I put myself out of my misery about just being on tenterhooks is um, very stressful. Um, uh, I can see we've got nearly a 1,000 people on the line with us tonight. So thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Catherine, I wanted to come back to you um, because I think there's been a lot said and done kind of about integrity this election. I know Labor was trying to focus a little bit on that um, this week, kind of touched on that in the press conference, uh, the press club address today with ending the, the waste and, and the rorts a little bit. And certainly a lot of those independent candidates whether or not it's the Teals in the inner city or um, people might have seen Kathy McGowan's Australian story, there's certainly a couple of regional independents um, having a crack as well. Integrity's really been a big issue this campaign, things like the federal ICAC, truth in political advertising, those kinds of things. Um, is that real? Do you think that'll um, bear out? no matter what the election result is, that that'll be a big issue for the next parliament? Yeah, well, it's, it's an interesting question, Eb, but obviously um, it, the, the, those issues that you've flagged, it, it sort of points to the realignment that's been underway in Australia over the last few election cycles. Um, uh, yeah, I did watch that very excellent uh, Australian story about Cathy McGowan, and she is a, she is a, a, a genuine change agent in Australian politics, but the independence movement, of course, predates her. In the 46th Parliament, we had Tony Windsor and Rob Oakeshott and, uh, and others before, right? So it, it is an interesting question, really, if there is, uh, you know, if we sort of step this out a little bit. Um, you know, Scott Morrison used to refer to an, a federal integrity commission as a fringe issue. Um, and that was, that was his diagnostic of the politics of it, i.e. there aren't any votes in it. That's why it's a fringe issue, right? So in this election, it's, be, it's been a front and centre issue because it's, be, it's been totemic for that non-major party political realignment that's going on at this point, right? If we look at the ANU election survey that's been in the field since 1987, we see this long-term, you know, as, as the country's becoming more polarised, weirdly, we're becoming a whole lot, lot, lot less partisan if that makes sense. So we've, we've basically had this period where the, the, the vote for the two major parties has, has been in decline in terms of, you know, historical standards, right? Yeah, and yeah. people are obviously casting around looking for a non-major party alternative. And the realignment or the, or the sort of the, the, the evidence of that realignment, long-term realignment in this particular contest has been the Teals, the, the, the Teal independence in the cities and other uh, uh, integrity and climate focused independents in other contests, right? Who are not necessarily affiliated with Climate 200 or take take their take their donations or whatever else, right? So anyway, a bit of a preamble here, but uh, trust me, I, I know where I'm going with it. It's sort of like there is obviously an appetite for this uh, because uh, you know, we we've seen the polls. Some of them will be dodgy. Some of them will be, you know, more or less in the ballpark. We can see these campaigns have gotten traction in this election campaign. So there is clearly, rather than being a fringe issue, it is actually a vote shifter, right? But one of the sort of interesting propositions, I suppose, for us to kind of roll around in our minds tonight, a couple of days ahead of the election, is this sort of funny scenario where I can see a scenario where a whole bunch of those teals win their contests, and I can also see a scenario where none of them do. But 
they, but nonetheless, they they receive you know quite substantial primary votes for mm. non-major party actors, right? Mm. Yeah, comes because back to... Catherine, people have to understand that these are blue ribbon safe liberal seats. Yeah. The margins are enormous, so yeah. as much as there's momentum, it's a huge task. To oh, win. That's, but it's it's already in a in, on one level, it's already done its job. The liberal platform, particularly on climate, is a direct result of the challenge of the teals. Um, they have not weaponized climate the way they have in former for in, in previous elections. And whether it's a one or a two election strategy, and I don't know if we want to go into this or this is a post-mortem, the Teals are a, a movement of com community independence is a realignment of politics because I see a lot of voters that if the Liberals find a way through, are not going to go back to that party and they're not going to go to the Greens, they're not going to go to Labor. So to, it, you know, it may not be a political party, but there is definitely a movement afoot that disrupts the two-party system mm -hmm. the same way as the Greens sort of disrupted yeah, Labor 20 Labor. years ago. And, yeah. you know, and, and there's the been Democrat. lots of bile directed at them, for, but for all of those that have been part of it, you know, you know, credit, like there, it has been a, a shift in Australian politics, whether you win, lose or draw on Saturday. Yeah, well, it's sort of like it's the biggest realignment on the centre-right since the Democrats, basically. Yeah. So, uh, but it is, again, sort of tracking to your question, Eb, which is, you know, wh where does this lead us? Um, I suppose, again, frustratingly, it's a bit of an open question, isn't it? Because obviously it leads us to a place, it leads us to a place in the event that some of these independents get into the parliament and particularly in the event that there is a balance of power minority parliament where these people can exert some influence both on climate change and also on the model, model of a federal integrity commission, right? That is one scenario that we're looking at. Uh, I don't know if it will be what happens on Saturday night, but that is that is one scenario. I suppose the sort of more, de the more depressing flip side of that is what happens if they get close, but none of them get up. And then it's a matter of, you know, is, is it a Labor Party in government that has a stronger climate policy and a commitment to in, implement an integrity commission or the coalition in power, which is not bringing forward a bill on an integrity commission unless the parliament passes exactly what the model Scott Morrison wants and a climate policy, which is sort of better on 2050, but no actual mm. substance to get you there. So I can't see the Teals doing a deal with the Libs, like with Morrison. And I, it's almost like the election he has. Why not, Pete, though? Because if they're in a Liberal seat, you know, that was formerly Liberal, even though there's a vote for change, you can see that they'd be. Because they will be, because Morrison can't deliver with the Nats and a government that is being torn between the Teals and the Nats is just going to be a total, like it, it, it is a trailer park on steroids, right? I, I just think there, there are three things. One is I don't think the Libs can deliver as, um, as good a response to what the Teals are after as Labor can. Secondly, I think it's in their self-interest because Labor's got skin in the game of keeping these guys in power. I always remember back to my time in New South Wales politics and the car government, there were all these independent country mayors and there was a huge incentive to give them five kilometres of road every year so they had something to show that it was, you know, they were delivering for their community. And, and, and Labor will much, have much more um, skin in keeping those guys in than the Liberals do. And thirdly, Morrison has been... And, and the candidates fighting them, they have not fought on issues. They've worked with the Murdoch press to monster and bully and do everything that motivated these people to get into politics in the first place. So I might be wrong. They might, they might all join hands and sing Kumbaya, but I just can't see it happening. I think if the Teals hold the balance of power, it'll be a minority Labor government, which will be a... It may not be a, an official power-sharing arrangement, but there is so much more alignment of values there than the other side. Yeah, and if I can briefly plug some Australia Institute integrity research from this week, we released um, the most, the, the largest and most comprehensive analysis of appointments to the AAT, the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, this week and found that the rate of political appointments has increased from about 5% under, or I think 6% under John Howard, 5 to 6% between John Howard to kind of Gillard Rudd's administrations, that skyrocketed to 40% under this current government, 
or about three in 10 yeah. overall over the period of coalition government. So the AAT has become a superannuation scheme for um, former <laughs> Liberal MPs, from what I can say. Um, it's just played into this um, integrity being an issue um, this week. Certainly, uh, I'll be interested to see what happens with that. Um, Catherine, I wanted to come back to you. All of this obviously is about who wins government, focus on the lower house seats. Pete saying, you know, there's um, dozens kind of that uh, that are in play. But I want to talk about the Senate as well. People have two votes when they go into the polling booth, one in the House of Reps and one in the Senate. And the Senate is really interesting this time around as well. You've been on the campaign trail Um uh, as well as, you know, reporting from the press gallery. What's your sense of the Senate race here and, and why, what do you think people should keep an eye on? Yeah, well, my favourite Senate uh, campaign of this election is definitely Eric Abetz' Below the Line campaign in Tasmania. That is my absolute <laughs> favourite. Keep Eric Abetz, who apparently is, a, is, a, you know, is, is um, you know, is not even affiliated with the Liberal Party anymore. He just stared, he puts Tasmania first. Uh, we discovered the Eric Below the Line election campaign during a trip uh, in northwest Tasmania just before basically the election was called. And I gather from the, from social media that it's gone from strength to strength, that whole sort of. So let's, let's see if... Um, Erica Betts could get back in, but just sort of like quickly in Taz, the, the, the interesting fight is for the final spot. And that's sort of between uh, Jackie Lambie's running mate, uh, Jackie Lambie's running mate, Tammy Tyrrell. And uh, there's also a very high profile One Nation bloke uh, running or trying to contest that final spot. So that's, that's pretty interesting. Obviously in Queensland, we've sort of got a cavalcade of, <laughs> of various folks on the right, uh, including Clive Palmer, who, you know, wants to return to politics and Campbell Newman's kicking around in that too. And anyway, so that, that that's that's all pretty interesting. Um, uh, also in South Australia, Nick Xenophon is obviously attempting a comeback. Uh, you know, can, can that succeed or not? I don't know. I just, I'm not close enough really to the dynamics in South Australia to know how that's panning out. Uh, but then, so we sort of have this scenario, I guess, in, in broad terms where, uh, where the Greens, uh, according to most of the polls we've seen, are, are, are tracking pretty well in polling terms and are likely to obviously return the largest sort of non-major party force in the Senate. Then it's a question of uh, who, who else uh, uh, in terms of the, the, the micro party actors. Uh, and then, you know, part of the reason that motivated, I know, Nick Xenophon to run again was this idea that one nation could get a, a block of three, um, which would sort of put them on various scenarios in a, in a balance of power block. And so the non sort of one nation forces in the micro party scene have definitely, I think, been trying to work out how to prevent that from happening or, or to try and put other boots on the ground in the Senate uh, for what happens afterwards. There is also, uh, if any uh, folks on the show tonight are Canberra residents, all of you will have seen the, uh, the campaign of David Pocock, who's a rugby union star player, and, uh, and also Kim Rubenstein, who's quite a high, high profile constitutional law professor in, in Canberra. Those two independents are trying to unseat Zed Zazelja, who is the Liberal, uh, the Liberal Senator in the ACT. Now, in the in the in the territory, we've had senators for 50 years, and basically we've had one one Labor, one Lib Liberal over that over that whole period of time. Uh, I think it's quite a tough ask for an independent to disrupt that pattern, that voting pattern in the ACT, but. Uh, there was an interesting development this week uh, in, in that Katie Gallagher, who is the Labor uh, Senator for the ACT and the Shadow Finance Minister, her campaign was obviously concerned enough about Pocock's momentum to, uh, to uh, warrant a, a cameo appearance via letter and video by Julia Gillard, who, uh, who makes a point of not engaging in political commentary or in campaigning. Uh, she, 
she's very, very judicious about how she appears and in what context. So I think that suggests that the Labor Party in the ACT is a bit worried that instead of the two independents uh, sort of taking from the Sizelja vote, in fact, what they're, what they're doing is splitting the, splitting the progressive vote. Which is uh, which is complicated, obviously. Um, so yeah, anyway, you've got the greens in that mix as and well. The greens in that pretty mix well in Canberra. No, exactly. The greens mm. as well. So it's sort of like it's it, look. It's very interesting. That's all <laughs> I'll say. The Senate. It's very interesting. There are many, many moving parts. Uh, I'm not quite sure how this sort of national jigsaw puzzle comes together at the end of the day, because right at the moment, I, you know, we're sort of flat out keeping up with the permutations in the House, let alone the Senate. But but there are many. The, the point of Ebb raising it is that there are there are many interesting dynamics in that Senate contest, and it does obviously impact what the next Parliament will do, and also the capacity of the non-major party actors, Greens, uh, you know, Jackie Lambie and running mate, One Nation, others, to, uh, to basically influence the agenda of the next government, uh, whether it's a Liberal one or a Labor one. Absolutely. And just while we're on the Senate, before we get to questions from the audience, the Australian Institute released some Senate research this week. Um, and I just want to remind everyone that you do have two votes because what we found is that actually a lot of people um, are misinformed about how Senate voting works. One in two Australians believe that when voting one to six in the Senate, that six ought to be beside the party you dislike more than any other, rather than your sixth sixth most preferred choice so basically if you want to put someone last if there's someone that you really loathe you've got to go the journey you've got to go on the whole journey and number everyone it's so it's so great to do that working out who your second and second you know exactly below the line and there is i mean that's my special joy in the voting booth (laughs) finding the person i hate the most and making but they sure should they do results on the least favourite. They should have the winner, but they should, should also have the, <laughs> the last place, like, as well. It'd make yeah, up. definitely. Sorry, drug calling. That's right. Um, well, we've got lots of questions here, um, so let's get to those. Um, and, again, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, nearly a 1,000 people at six, uh, 6 in the evening, so we really appreciate it. Um, uh, Linda Talberg <laughs> asks, will the wave of negative ads targeting independence have any impact or will it be counterproductive? Pete, do you want to talk to us a little bit about yes. the impact of negative advertising? This is interesting because if you talk to the teal independents, their biggest challenge is name recognition. If someone knows their name, their chances of getting their vote goes, go figure it. Up. So last week, if you remember, the Telegraph and the Herald Sun put out these front pages with the names and photos of all the candidates and everything they'd said, thinking that was going to do their damage. Apart from the fact that very, very few people in those electorates read the Telegraph and the Herald Sun, it was totally playing into their hands. I suspect the same thing is happening with um, the, the negative campaigning that's being run. If name recognition is your challenge and you are the target of an ad, I could not believe that Josh Frydenberg went head to head with Monique Ryan in a debate. Like talk about raising your opponent's recognition. And all the way through, it's been this hyper ventilating. Yeah, you know, remember Tim and Tim Wilson was the same. They're just fakes. They're just and he was just elevating them the whole time. The best way you deal with something like that is I think you you A don't give them oxygen and B placate, but the libs have done the exact opposite. Catherine, anything to add to that? Oh, I think that's broadly right. I do think there's been um, a sort of extraordinary name recognition dynamic around this federal campaign, which, as Pete says, is partly the Libs really elevating their opponents by talking about them every five minutes. Um, so, so there's that, and and also that's uh, there's there's also been because of that, those factors in terms of the realignment that we were addressing a little bit earlier. It's quite a lot of community interest, obviously, in these campaigns. And, and the thing about the modern media is that we we know, we, we obviously know what articles people are reading, how many people are reading the material. And if people are interested in it, then it becomes a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy that more, you know, 
reader interest begets more coverage. So I think uh, in that sense, like there's been a free media bonanza really for the independents in this campaign. But we need to bear in mind though, even though I, I agree in the broad that basically it's, it's helped them rather than hinder them. Uh, like uh, political parties engage in negative advertising because it works because uh, it's not because you know, they just want to be awful. It's because it works. So obviously some of those ads, some of those messages will, I'm sure, have had an impact on uh, soft liberal or soft major party voters of, of both stripes who are contemplating voting for an independent rather than their party of choice. Yeah. It, will, it will cause some people to hesitate, I think. But in, the, in a macro sense, though, I think it's more plus than minus. Yeah. Pete, do you reckon uh, you were just talking about kind of that rookie era of mentioning your opponent there when name recognition is a big problem? Do you think part of that is just that Tim Wilson and Josh Frydenberg and the like are in safe seats and they've never really had to campaign before for their never, seat. They've never had to make their own sandwiches, have they? <laughs> they've always had to cut lunch. <laughs> it's like, oh, what, do I, what do I do? What do I do? Do I just hate them? Do I attack them? Like, Jesus. Like, um, look, the Teals have got under the guard. Like, I think they knew how serious they were. Like, Simon Holmes, a court, to his credit, has built a machine and he's done it with a degree of um, ethic that his opponents do, do not give him credit for it, that he's created a, a funding pool and then said, you match it, you go out and build your own campaigns, we'll support you, we're not going to tell you what to do, but there are some basic values that we expect you to be um, propounding. They have got serious money, serious volunteer networks, serious engine underneath that's driving their advertising. And, you know, I reckon they've out-campaigned political parties a political party that's been doing it forever yeah and they've come in with a better model now i'm not saying they're all going to win but i think the initial thing was particularly after last time where there was that whole flurry that we're going to win all these seats the get up was going to win seats and everything that you know that libs would turn green that it was all a false dawn i think this is more real i'm not saying they're all going to get up but i would not be surprised four or five are very, very close. Yeah, um, I have to think right. that with so many running, odds would suggest at least one would get up, but uh, we'll, we'll see very soon. Um, the next question I've got is from Vince Taranto, and I think this might be one for you, Pete, although, um, Catherine, you might want to chime in. Any thoughts on how the huge pre-poll vote should be seen? Protest vote, pro-labour, fatigued voters? Who votes early? Uh, I just think people that you know, just want to get it out of the way. I'm interested in the postal vote this time with COVID. I think a lot of people are trying to sort of stay still. You know, COVID is still out there. It's been really interesting, the lack of focus. I know Catherine asked the question to Alba at the press club today. It's almost like the, the elephant in the room. And I'm not quite sure what the decision matrix is on that, but I do think it affects a lot of people's behaviours, particularly people, for instance, living with disability, whose campaign I've been working really hard on to get that up on the national agenda. Big rally in Melbourne tomorrow, by the way, if anyone's down there, we're um, marching from the NDIA to the AAT um, to, keep, <laughs> to keep that issue rolling along. Um, I don't have the data on it yet. I think often um, the pre-poll is recorded and, and marked as slightly different and we'll be able to look at it afterwards. Um, there, there are three sorts of pre-poll as well, of course. There's the people that turn up to booths beforehand. There's people that do postals and often a high Liberal vote because traditionally the Liberals would organise people to go out and help people in nursing homes and older people vote. And then you've got the COVID, the COVID vote as well. Yeah, Catherine, do you have any sense of that? Uh, no, I think that's broadly it. I mean, obviously there has been um, increasing trend for pre-poll in, in Australia. Um, uh, over the last couple of elections, there's been more and more of it. Um, COVID is obviously a factor. And I think there's, you know, obviously an undecided voter is not pre-polling, <laughs> right? People going to pre-poll know who they're voting for, right? So there will be at least, there'll, there'll be a high proportion, I think, of some of those people There'll, there'll be some COVID people. There'll be some people who have made up their mind already. And I, I've i lost count of the number of people who have just approached me as I'm out and about to say, oh, look, you know, I, I, you know you're lovely, but I'm not, I cannot read a word of anything in this campaign. I know who I'm voting for. I don't want that noise in my head. 
I just want this to be done. So um, I, I suspect that explains, um, you know, at least some of the foot traffic as well. Yeah. Um, I can see a question here um, that is, oh, now I've lost it. Where did it go? There was someone asking about this book over my shoulder, Judith. Uh, the copy of The Nordic Edge, a terrific book, which has many suggestions. Thank you, Judith. I contributed a chapter to it. It's just um, product placement. <laughs> that's right. Um, and uh, does that have many suggestions for where we can realistically start? Um, this week we talked about um, the Nordic approach to housing. So Australia very much has a, a focus on uh, just the private housing market. You've got to buy a house or you've got to pay uh, a landlord uh, rent. Um, Nordic models have much bigger roles for public and social housing in affordable housing and also co-ops, which um, uh, make up, I think, up to 40% of housing, in the housing market in some country, some Nordic countries, where either people are part of a rental co-op or part of an ownership co-op structure. Um, and so there are different models out there. So that's my little... Can I say one thing about the Nordic model? Because I've been yeah. thinking about this. So I'm interested in your thoughts, Catherine. I reckon if the Teals win, if, if the Teals win three or four seats, regardless of the result, I think the Liberal Party is going to be pushed to the right. Um, I think it could be a cycle, it could be for the long term, it could become a Republican MAGA style party. If Morrison wins doing what he does and they say, this is how we hold him to power, they become MAGA. If there is a Labor minority government with the Teals, they're just going to go crazy. They're going to become more MAGA. There's and if a couple it's of Labor questions or, on this it's as going well. To, like, I think the Libs are on the track to MAGA. Now, my concern is in a two-party state, you don't want one of your parties MAGA. You want to start thinking about much more a Scandinavian and European-style network of parties and alliance building. And so if we get the bad result that is minority government, um, it might actually be really positive in the long term because we're starting to sort of evolve from this two-party monolith to something that has a bit more like a social democratic party, a Green Party and a Labor Party, maybe sharing power and negotiating power. Now, I know my friends in Labor will hate that because they hate the Greens and they hate the idea that, but it might, I don't want to live in a society where the you know, two-party state, where one of the parties is MAGA. I just don't want that. I want something that has a little bit more, um, you know, texture than that. Catherine, there is a couple of people in the in the questions who are asking about, yeah, if um, if either Teal independents get up or uh, the coalition loses or is in a minority government situation. I know you wrote about this week what happens to the Liberal Party and what lessons would they learn in such an event. Can you just share your thoughts on on that with us, please? Well, well, the the, the lesson the Liberal Party I would hope would learn is is the lesson of inclusion. If a if they basically lose a swathe of seats with moderates in the cities, um, you know that's that's a referendum on performance. That's uh, and and you would hope that the lesson, the takeaway from that was, you know, we need to we need to resist those populist tendencies. We need to build a more inclusive political movement that you know that that speaks to progressive centre right people in Australia. Um, but the risk, of course, is that's not the lesson learned. And the, the sort of most interesting undercurrent in this election is that the Prime Minister has clearly made a choice uh, that his pathway to hanging on involves flipping uh, outer suburban and regional Labor seats, because in his mind, he's at least it's sort of the insurance principle, right? I don't think Morrison ever sat down and thought, oh, I'm actually writing off Josh Frydenberg and Trent Zimmerman and all, you know, like who cares what happens to them? I don't think that's actually what happened. But I think the Prime Minister is risk managing a scenario where the Liberal Party loses up to five seats and uh, is then therefore hunting for gains on the other side of the column, which brings comparisons here to Boris Johnson and the Red Wall strategy that he deployed in the election in Britain in 2019. That's basically using Brexit, weaponised debate about Brexit, to basically recruit uh, traditional Labor voters to the Tory column. So there's there's been you know, a, a discussion about this in this election. Um, it's sort of, I think I think some of that discussion's a bit overblown because if we look at the Liberal Party uh, over the last, there's been a 30 year project basically to recruit Labor's base. I don't think this has just happened in this election. I think that has been a 30 year project. But 
it's difficult to know exactly how it bounces out because we 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 just don't we don't have the specifics yet. But look, a scenario where the Teals won all the seats, including Josh Frydenberg's, for example, well, uh, and and uh, and and the Liberal Party goes into opposition. Well, the next leader of the Liberal Party will be Peter Dutton. He's in the box seat to be the next leader of the Liberal Party if Josh Frydenberg has been literally wiped off the map. Then it's a question of where Dutton chooses to position the Liberal Party. Now, as I said in my piece just quickly last Saturday, the, the sort of performative Peter Dutton who appears in public is a bit different to the, the person who interacts with colleagues and has a, and has a ministry. He's actually quite personable and quite pragmatic and, and uh, you know, so anyway, we shouldn't just assume that Peter Dutton means Donald Trump. But I think the thing about opposition is that all the incentives go to go for hyper-partisanship hyper and conflict. Tony Abbott model. Tony Abbott model. Mm. So and, there's, and, and given that we've seen that, there needs to be a strategy on the left to contain and balkanise those guys and Murdoch. Like, it just has to be thought through, doesn't it? I know that's your job, but... <laughs> that's well above my pay grade. <laughs> but, but anyway. um, I will just interrupt with uh, we've yeah. only um, got a, a few bit loose. Go here. Yeah. And Stephen yeah. Masters and many other people want to know who we're tipping to win. Will there be a winner? How many independents? I, I would like to say that I'm currently third on the Australian Institute's AFL tipping comp. Uh, <laughs> and so I just I don't think we can be cowards here. We've got to call it. Um, Pete, what's your prediction based off Guardian Essential polling? Well, based on the polling history and my waters, <laughs> um, which Catherine and I have been talking about our waters a lot. We I reckon a there's, lot about our waters. there's about eight yeah. likely gains, Brisbane, Reed, Benelong, Chisholm, Higgins, Boothby, Pierce and Swan. There's about another seven or eight that on a good night they get. There's probably up to four losses. Like the Libs, I don't think, would go beyond Lingiari, Gilmore, and maybe Parramatta and Blair. And then there's up to eight teal contests. So it's all over the place. If you had to ask me, I think Labor gets to, say, 76, 77. They might go as high as 82, 83, I think. And, and, and this is my problem. If you look at history, um, since World War II, government has not changed without the wave. So that why I'm freaking out isn't that I don't think Labor will get there. I just don't see the waves. This will be truly historic if it's a, na a, a narrow win from opposition. But I think at the moment I'm feeling like it's going to be a narrow win from opposition. So we're going to make history. All right. Catherine, your tip? I'm not doing predictions. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not. No, no, no. I'll just, oh, no, a couple of generalities. And Peter, Peter knows my view. Anyway, I, I all along largely because of 2019, not because of any problem with Albanese's strategy. I think his strategy has been the right one. Uh, but because of 2019, and I've said it on this show a lot, so if you're a regular, you'll hear me say it again. Because of 2019, this is a very difficult election for Labor to win because there, there are electoral buffers in parts of the country that are, that are very difficult Hard. to unwind. Yeah. Uh, you need massive swings to unwind them. So... That remains my view. I think it is difficult for Labor to win. Um, I think there is a contest. I, I, I think absolutely there is a contest. And uh, I, I think it's close, just based on looking at what the two leaders are doing, how they're comporting themselves, their body language, how you know their sort of their flips and their and, and the way they're adjusting their messaging. There's definitely a contest. Now, uh, I know also, you know, so, so look, I think it's possible, it is possible Labor wins. I'm convinced there's a contest. Like at this point in 2019, Labor, Labor had already lost. Hmm. It's just no one knew it. <laughs> it was the sixth sense, wasn't it? it was, yeah. Well, <laughs> like it, it, was, it was done. It was already done. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's already done in this election. I think there is a contest and I think it is possible Labor emerges victorious from it. But I do think it's very close and, uh, and a lot has to go right in the final 48 hours when the undecideds are, uh, are watching. I can see what the Prime Minister is doing with his messaging. I think he knows exactly what he's doing. Uh, I, honestly, I honestly don't know who wins this election. I don't know. So that's my prediction. I don't know. <laughs> well, that's I don't Socratic know wisdom, Catherine. 
But well, from the beginning. No, but I have to be honest. I have yeah. to be honest. I don't know. No, never yeah, do I. I'm still hoping though. No, yeah, no. and I think everyone learned, um, you know, how, how rubbish predictions were the last time around. But uh, my uh, guess has always been a, 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 a power sharing parliament. I think at least a couple of independents are going to get up. I'm not sure what side they'll take from or how it will change the, the balance of power. But uh, I do think um, that's been that's been my tip from the beginning. At the beginning, I thought uh, a coalition, you know, independence leaning coalition. I kind of swung back to Labor, and, and now because of the polls tightening, I'm swinging back uh, to the coalition. But maybe Pete can convince me that, that there's no way Teal Independence would um, would back the coalition. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for joining us at this special time this evening for our prime time poll position. Uh, don't forget to head on over to uh, essentialreport.com.au for the full results. You can find Catherine and Pete's analysis at Guardian Australia. Uh, please do check it out. Don't forget you've got two votes in uh, the ballot box, the House of Reps, but also think about your important Senate vote and number all of those numbers across the line or all of the numbers below the line if, like me, you lack the very excellent satisfaction of putting the person you like least <laughs> dead last. Um, thanks so much for joining us tonight, everyone. Stay safe out there. Use your vote wisely. And we'll wrap it up there. Thank you so much, everyone. Stay safe. Talk to you soon. Hey, See you after the election.